Bravo. Welcome to this uh, seminar. Um, great excitement in Miss Wasland where uh, Sanat is about to submit his PhD. We're going to see a summary of all his work um, today. If you're a GPS satellite navigation type person, Kalman filtering is something which you would have heard a lot about. You go to GNSS conferences, there's dozens of papers on Kalman filters. In fact, even going back to 1992, when I did my own master's thesis, it was on the Kalman filter for attitude determination. So Kalman filtering is probably the most boring topic in satellite navigation. So, how can this be made more interesting? Well, all those papers I was just talking about very rarely make any drastic change to anything. But what we're going to see today does in fact change um, in quite an important way how um, Kalman filters are done in a practical sense. And so I've looked into some of the theory behind that and shown how they uh, relate to nonlinearity and so on. So I think this, um, this work that he's done is probably going to get a lot of citations. Uh, I think it's uh, in particular for the uncentered counter filter, which doesn't get a mention in the title, but it's the way that uncentered counter filters will be done in the future, hopefully will use the techniques that Sanat's about to talk about. So um, we might as well get going for the rest of the hour. Please welcome Sanat. with the Cameron Filter presentation. Very risky. <laughs> we'll be awake in 15 minutes. So, yes. So, for the last three and a half years, I have been working on Cameron Filter, nonlinearity, and their application specific navigation. So, I'm really glad to share the, some interesting findings of this research today with you. So, let's jump into the contribution of, of my work. So, what I did was that I developed two new fast unscented color fil filters, which are computationally much more efficient than conventional unscented color filter. Then, so we uh, so we applied these two uh, unscented color filters and found that they reduce the processing time. But what is the theor theoretical basis of this? So it's only one application we found. So we did the theoretical analysis and showed that the computation uh, time has a bit of limitations. So how much computation time can, can be improved that has a bit of limitation, which we will discuss later on. And then we established the relation between the nonlinearity and the unscented Kalman filter performance. So unscented Kalman filter, uh, till now, people, uh, or in our community, the notion is that if system is uh, mildly nonlinear, EKF can do. But uh, if it's highly nonlinear, we can replace EKF with UKF. But the major question is how nonlinear is highly nonlinear? What is high and what is low? That quantification has not been done, and this quantification, you, uh, the, you, uh, what is the relation between this quantified notion of nonlinearity with done kind of parameter performance? That was not done before. So this relation I tried to establish here. And then finally, we found that the, the filter performance where, uh, depends on the dimension of precision of G, uh, GPS measurements. So that theory I'll present at last. So the outline of the research is how I ended up working on common filter. So I, uh, when I started my PhD, I started with uh, implementation of EKF and UKF in low Earth satellite orbit navigation problem. So after the implement, uh, implementation, we found that unscented color filter is, takes a lot of computation time in EKF, and there's not much improvement. So the questions are then, so always unscented color filter has been presented in such a way that if you have a nonlinear estimation problem, unscented color filter will, will give you a very good accurate result. So, but our pro application uh, say, uh, showed exactly opposite of that. So both are EKF and UKF giving the same performance. Why? That's one question. Another question is, 
how do we reduce the competition time of UKF? So I, I took these questions and tried to answer that how, how do we deal with it. So then we have developed the single propagation uncentered carbon, fil carbon filter and extrapolated single propagation uncentered carbon filter, which are capable of reducing the competition time at the, uh, till up to 90% uh, while retaining the accuracy of the uh, uncentered carbon filter itself. Then we found that for some systems the accuracy is significantly high uh, than the EKF, but for some cells, some systems like satellite navigation, the accuracies are same. So we wanted to uh, find out so is, uh, is there a difference between nonlinearity of several different systems. So is there a different nonlinearity in LU orbit? Is there a different nonlinearity in reentry vehicle? Is there a different nonlinearity in launch vehicle? And what is the relationship between nonlinearity and the equipment performance improvement? That was uh, the next task and then we also do deep the competition, competition complexity analysis. And also we had applied these new column filters and the new uncentered color filters in, in logic vehicle using GPS measurements and we found that, that DOP varies. So we found that the high probability relation is there with DOP and beta performance. So let's start with a bit of revisiting color filter framework. So consider a general estimation problem. So in general estimation problem, we uh, describe a system using a nonlinear differential equation. So the y is a state vector, which is which has the several values which which we want to know what uh, uh, the what is the evolution of these state variables over time, and then this y dot is. Uh, equal to a function of the y itself and there's a, a function of the uh, Gaussian noise. This function f is a nonlinear function and if you see that the way I'm presenting is very generic. So although I have said that this is for specific navigation problem, but you can apply it in econometrics. You can apply this theory in, um, in um, several other estimation problem in, ke uh, in chemical engineering also. In chemical engineering, they do a lot of estimation problem. You can apply there. Whenever this nonlinear problem, uh, estimation problem comes in, you can apply it. And then we have a measurement. So this measurement, again, is a nonlinear function of this state y. So in real life, we only have this information. And this is just a theory. So how do we fuse this actual measurement and this theoretical knowledge of the system? Karman filter, developed by Rudolf Karman, he gave a very simple process of doing that, which is known as Karman filter, can be applied for non-linear problems. For non-linear problems, this is called extended Karman filter, which was first implemented in Apollo 11 mission for lunar landing. So that uh, they, there they use the uh, we can see the first use of extended carbon filter. What e extended carbon filter does is that say up to the two dimensional case. So we have a state element in this axis and another state element in this axis. So our initial mean state vector is this point, and this is the this ellipse gives us the represents the uncertainty. In extended carbon filter, there's two states. One is called for prediction state, and another is the update state. In prediction state, it takes this point, propagates using solving this differential equation or integrating this differential equation using this equation to the next time step t plus relative. So this is done in a nonlinear way, but this uncertainty is propagated in, in a linear fashion. So you can see this uncertainty just, it just increased, didn't change the shape of ellipse didn't change anything. So this property always uh, retains here due to the linear, linear propagation, it just increases. Then we use a Ricard equation, metric Ricard equation to find the color gain. And then we try to reduce this, whatever is that uncertainty increase, we reduce using the measurements. So if this system is 
very nonlinear, this linear approximation will not work. For that kind of applications comes the unscented carbon filter developed in 2000s by Julian Kuhlman and also there's an Australian Dutch in non-centered carbon filter. So if you have heard about Red White, is a very famous uh, scientist in robotics. Um, he was also involved in the development of this unscented carbon filter. So what unscented carbon filter does is that, unlike EK, in EK there's only one uh, state vector propagation. You have this mean here, it is propagated. But also, there are several other strategically fixed points based on the uncertainty. So you calculate this strategically fixed, fixed point based on the given uncertainty and propagate all of them. So definitely you can understand that this will take a lot, lot more longer time for uncertainty carbon filter than EK because in EK there is only one propagation, here is multiple. So for example, if you use a numerical integration method like Ranjit Gupta method, there, there will be, in each iteration, you have to evaluate this function four times. And the rule of this, selecting these points are, if you have n number of state variables in the vector, then you have to select 2n plus 1. You have to select 2n plus 1 grid points or sigma points to propagate. So you can see, so we had, for extended common filter, you have to uh, evaluate f for four times. Here, it will be 4 multiplied by 2n plus 1. So that's huge amount of uh, computation time it will take. So what we're proposing to reduce this computation time? So what I, I propose is that we don't need to propagate all of the sigma points. We can only propagate only one, exactly like the concentrated carbon filter. But then we can reconstruct the other points based on the increment. So we know these grid points and we know the mean. So we know the what are the increments for each point, right? So see this uh, this bit of GIF like representation. So it's first propagating, and then we are using that increment to recreate all those points. We are not using any propagation. So on using only one propagation, we can approximate this value. So how do we do this approximation? We use Taylor series appro uh, approximation, specifically first order Taylor series approximation. Yeah. So this is the Jacobian of the integral. But again, this might not work for some some systems if it's highly nonlinear. If, if second order Taylor series times are very dominant. So, but still we keep this in mind. So let's say this method of finding this approximation is called is n one. Now we'll go for extrapolated single propagation of uncertain carbon filter, which uh, accounts for the second order terms. So what in extrapolated single propagation of uncertain carbon filter we do is that we know this increment, but we increment in blue <coughs> steps. So you can see the first we increment are small, and then we increment in full steps. So this is for method N2. If you recall Richardson, Richardson approximation, so you can approximate um, one order correctly if you use this 2n2 minus n1. So that's why uh, we are using the results of uh, SPUKF here, this n1. That's why I ask you to remember this. So if you use this, you can see the only error is on the third order term. So, so we have accommodated all the second order terms in the estimation. So in SPUK, what we use is that 2n2 minus n1 as a pro predicted state. So in that case, we have found that that uh, improves the accuracy um, and it matches with the unsended color filter. Now let's talk about the results. So these are the frameworks for EKF, UK, SPUK, SPUKF. So there is a benchmark, benchmark problem that this particular problem has always been used for uh, performance analysis of uh, nonlinear common filters since 1964, 65. So if, from that time, this particular problem is there in the research community. We just use this simple problem to show that how the developed filters are good. So what is this problem? It's a vertical reentry vehicle. 
So it's uh, our entry vehicle is entering the atmosphere and it's falling vertically. We are interested to estimate the altitude, the velocity, and the aerodynamic coefficient of the reentry vehicle. And we have the only radar measurement R. So this gives us the range. So out of this, how can we get these estimates? We use all the filters. Extended carbon filter, uncentered carbon filter, SPUK, ESPUK. So there is another one player in this filter uh, uh, or family of filters that's called spherically, uh, spherically simplex unscented carbon filter, SSUK. This kind of tries to reduce the processing time, but it doesn't reduce more than 50%. So we used all these. So you can see the results here for altitude estimation, velocity estimation, and aerodynamic coefficient estimation. So for EK, average error is 27.91 feet. I'm using feet because that quantities they were using in other papers. So we have to be a bit of consistent for the uh, for comparison. So for EK, it's 27 feet. UKF is one feet, drastical change. ACS UKF is one feet two. SPUKF provides us 14.69 feet error, which is definitely less than the EKF. And then SPUKF UKF gives us 2.04, almost matches UKF. Now, take a look at this processing time. In processing time, EKF is much more faster than UKF. 1.5 millisecond per for every step. UKF takes 21 millisecond. ACS UKF 14 millisecond. So as I said, it doesn't even reduce 50 percent operation time. For SPUKF, SPUKF it's two millisecond. ESPUKF is three millisecond. So we uh, using these two filters, we can actually improve the estimation accuracy then the EKF also reduce the computation time of the EKF. So this, is, this gives us an average error and processing time in a more nice way. You can see that EKF is here. Bad accuracy, good processing time. Here, good accuracy, bad processing time. So SS UKF is here, SP UKF is here. It's pushing the boundary towards left. And the ESP UKF is for this application is really optimal. That's what we want to apply for this problem. Now let's apply this to satellite navigation problem and see what happens. How do we simulate the scenario? We are not mounting a GPS on a satellite and experimenting on it. We will simulate it. So we have a simulator called Spider Genesis Simulator. So that's, uh, that comes with a hardware and software package. So there, in that software, you can put the AEO, AEO orbit, and then this hardware will generate the DNSS signals. We used UNSW Namaruchi V3 GNSS receiver. We tricked to this receiver to think that it is on a satellite. So the, GP, uh, the receiver thinks that, that it is on a satellite, and it gets the relevant signals as if it is an orbit. So we get the GNSS measurement, we can get the GNSS satellite position and use estimation algorithms. And we have the reference orbit, we, uh, we compare the reference orbit and compare the uh, output of the estimation algorithm to see how much error is there. You can see all the average errors are almost same. All the average errors are almost same, but you look at the processing time, that is actually tallies with what we have claimed. So the big question is why this is behaving like this? Why this for AU satellite navigation, the filters are behaving in the same way? But note that this, this problem is also nonlinear. This problem is also nonlinear, but the filters are not, UKFs are not working as uh, this was supposed to. So that's a big question. Let's go to logical trajectory estimation. So again, we take the, this time we are using TR GPS receiver. So 
This gear diffuse receiver is optimized for very high acceleration. Uh, acceleration. So during a very high acceleration of launch vehicle, it can catch lock the signal, GPS signals here. We treat this receiver that it is in a launch vehicle, and then again we got the uh, the measurement and we got uh, uh, we got the reference of it, the re reference trajectory, and then. We use the estimation algorithm to estimate the trajectory and come back. What we are interested on esti estimating launch vehicles. So we are interested in estimating the altitude, interested in estimating the downrange range distance from the launching point. We want to know the velocity towards the direction of the uh, launch vehicle motion. We also want to know what is the flight path angle the angle between the body axis and the local horizon. So with that, we also want to know what is the aerodynamic coefficient. It's there, but we want to es estimate this. Uh, so that was uh, that's how we uh, model the system. And then what we found was that we applied all the filters, EKF, SPUKF, SPUKF, EKF. So we are not considering SP, uh, SSUKF at all because that actually is not very important we, here. So you can see that, again, extended current filter output uh, accuracy is always bad. Then SPUK, then ESPUK and UK. So what we did was that we done the experiments with multi, did some Monte Carlo simulation. So for number of observations four, number of observations six, eight, and 10. So for all the conditions, you can see that it follows the previous reentry vehicle pattern. So you can see that EKF is always uh, have a good uh, good processing time but bad accuracy. UKF has good accuracy but bad processing time, and EKF, uh, SPUKF and SPUKF are giving the desired very good um, trade good trade off between accuracy and the processing time. Also notice that the dilution of precision, with dilution of precision, the error varies. So we, this is an interesting observation, the error ratio by, uh, with the error ratio, which is the error divided by dilution of precision multiplied by um, <coughs> noise of the measurement, that is changing with different number of satellites and if you use this for estimation that is not supposed to happen. So that is another question we will try to answer at the later part of this presentation. And so this is also another result. This is uh, I think without using here receiver but again it shows the similar kind of characteristics. What are the observations we are finding from this? So, we found that SPUKF and SPUKF is giving better computational efficiency than the UKF for the example applications, except ADO satellite. And then unsettled current filter reduces the estimation error for some systems. Why? That's the question. And filter accuracy depends on DOP. Again, why? So then we try to answer this. Does, uh, how does these Competition time is affected. So there, we found that the competition time uh, improvement of SPUKF and SPUKF depends on three things. One is the number of state variables in your step vector, the integration step size, what you are choosing, and also the complexity of your system. So, based on these parameters, your competition time efficiency improvement would change. So we, if, if you calculate the competition time for very general way, so you can find that for UKF, it's a quadratic equation, quadratic function of A and H and J. And SPUKF is cubic function. SPUKF it is a quadratic function. So this actually doesn't give us a lot of information visually. So we try to put make a better visualization to see what is actually happening with variation of number of state. 
where, where number of step variables with variation of step size, integration step size, and with variation of the computational complexity or of the system itself. What you find is that if the step size is lower, the integration step size is lower, in that case, if you keep on increasing the number of states, the efficiency increases till certain point and then starts decreasing. And then if you keep on increasing the um, um, integration step size, you can find that this rate of decreasing in this part actually reduces. So for higher uh, uh, higher uh, integration, you can see that it takes a lot of states, like 340, 350 states. If you have 340 state variables, in that case, the computational time will be significantly less for SPU case. For ESPU case, so as you, if you remember that, for ESPU case, we have to compute twice. That's why, obviously, computation time will be less than SPU case. Uh, if you, uh, improvement will be less than SPU case, and also it changes very drastically with state elements. So you can see that at around 10, uh, uh, 20 to 30 number of state elements, the computation time would be almost similar to UK. So, all, so if we have a system with 20 or 30 elements, in that case, actually, this new filters will not be of use. But if you have some state elements somewhere, three or four or five or six, in that case, it has a very high efficiency. So most of the real-time application in satellites, or, or uh, more generally for space vehicles, you don't have really more than 15, 15 states. So for those applications, these are really a uh, good choice of feature. Now, so that answers that, uh, under what uh, conditions these uh, features will give us a very good estimation for and what are the limitations. Now, the important question about why in LEO orbit it didn't work. Why in LEO orbit all the features have the same characteristics? So we hypothesize that there's a relation between the degree of non-linearity of a system and measurement with the UKF and EKF performance. So we call, let us define a term for relative UKF performance. Relative UK performance is a difference between the UK accuracy and UK accuracy divided by the UK accuracy. So that's a relative UK performance improvement. If it is a high, then high performance. If it is low, then their performance is more or less similar. So, as I have previously told that there is no rigorous mathematical relation between the non-linearity and relative UK performance. So we have tried to establish that mathematical framework. So we already have a bit of how to measure non-linearity. That's called a young piece non-linearity index in 2000. Um, or this, this term has been coined in 1999, almost, almost at that time. In 2009, it was established. But this, 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 this non-linearity index measure was used in control problems. Control problem is not an estimation problem. They were uh, they were say uh, they were uh, publishing in in some papers that yes we have we know that if non-linearity in, in index increases, uh, UKF can give a better performance. But how the what is the relation? Can we predict the performance of improvement by the UKF using uh, using the non-linearity? So if we already have known the non-linearity index then we don't want to Im implement any filter. We want to s know whether it, the UK will give us better or not. And that way a designer can choose properly in a, without using a trial and error method like us. So I, I started for uh, uh, impl implementing UKF in a satellite navigation problem, hoping that that would improve the nonlinear, uh, improve the efficiency, uh, but it didn't. So we we don't want to we don't want that some other people should run into that problem. So that's why we try to answer that is there any relation. 
if you have a relation, then you don't have to implement anything. You can use this relation and just say, okay, we use ZK or we use ZK. So what does this nonlinear index, uh, what is the definition of nonlinear index? The definition of nonlinear index is that it is a supremum, different, supremum of the Hilbert-Schmidt norm of um, Jacobian. Uh, this Jacobian is a variation, and this is a true Jacobian divided by the, by the true Jaco Jaco Jacobian Hilbert-Schmidt norm. So it, will, it has to be the supremum one. So what basically, what, what does it say? It's too much mathematical term. Uh, Hilbert Schmidt norm, Jacobian, what does it basically say? It says actually that, that what is the normalized rate of change if you in, uh, change the initial state a little bit? That's what it says in a scalar form. So let's see, let's say we have a set vector here and this is the maximum uncertainty possible. So this is called the worst case ellipsoid boundary. So we pick some points here that on, uh, we, we can have some states in these points. So we propagate this, calculate in the next time and we find the true value, we find the associated true Jacobian, we find the associated um, Jacobians for these points and take the supremum of that. So that supremum of the maximum value would be the nonlinear index. But how does it relate between the <coughs> between the UPF and EKF performance? So this is the equation or inequality. You can see this epsilon E is the EKF error, which is a Hilbert Schmidt norm norm of EKF error, and epsilon U is the Hilbert Schmidt norm of UKF error divided by the Hilbert Schmidt norm of EKF error, which is the relative efficiency. That is always less than the sum of nonlinear index, the half of sum of nonlinear index of system and nonlinear of index of measurement, plus some term zeta, which is very small, or one. So you have to take minimum of whichever, this term or one. So you can definitely see that this term cannot be greater than one, right? This term cannot be greater than one. So sometimes you can see in some occasions from the index can exceed one. Then there will be a bit of contradiction. To, to avoid this contradiction, we have to take this minimum of this term and one, whichever it is minimum. And this relative efficiency will not exceed this limit. So that actually doesn't give us a very good idea. We have a relationship, but it doesn't give a very good bound of the relative efficiency with uh, efficiency. So what we have we have done is that bit of probability analysis. So this what we are doing is that this is a stochastic deterministic problem. So differential differential problem. So in stochastic problems, there is a probability always associated. So we can use this the Chebyshev's uh, inequality to do some analysis on probabilities. Probability. So let us for this uh, for for better understanding, let us shorten this down. So let's uh, uh, gamma is that relative efficiency. And lambda is that minimum of nonlinearity index sum or one. So if we use what Chebyshev's inequality tells us, Chebyshev's inequality tell, tells us that the what is the maximum pro possible probability that the this a uh, variable lambda will be greater than b. So the original equation is that. Here, instead of lambda square, it should be expected value of uh, expected value of gamma square. But we can see that from here that all the values has to be less than this term. So obviously, 
we can replace this expected value of lambda, uh, lambda with expected value of gamma with lambda square, right? So we have this bound. Also, there is another two-sided bound we can provide that what is the maximum uh, or what is the minimum probability that the value of gamma will be within the within a range of a and b. So this gives us a maximum probability bound. Uh, sorry, a minimum probability bound. But this equation is much more important, but we have two terms, unknown terms, a and b. We know lambda, we know gamma, but a and b are unknown. So we have to use this equation of inequality, inequality also um, to find out uh, definitive values of a and b. So what we so if you notice that these actually forms a conic section, these also forms a conic section. We will uh, we will take the points at the intersection of these two conic sections and find out a and b because two equations two one one gives us obviously two one equation two one one will not give you a uh, single solution, right? So if we use equate these terms and finally we can find that the bound of gamma is like this. So what is this p term? Well, p is the range of the actual probability of gamma. So gamma will be in this, in this range and you can find this range, this upper bound and this lower bound are actually proportional to the nonlinearity. So it's a bit of Irony, you can say. So these bounds are linear with with the nonlinearity index. So, uh, oh, what these conic sections actually mean here? So let, let us consider a nonlinearity index of 0.4 and 0.8. For 0.4 and 0.8, this is the gives us the conic section which gives the lower bound, lower bound and this one gives us the upper bound. So here you can say at point 0.8, these values are coinciding. So this is a bit of geometric idea of what we were doing. And if we say, now we want to examine, what is the probability, or, or we will to examine that, the, what is the range of lam lambda with probability more than 0.8? So more than 0.8 is sufficient for our estimation. Right, so we are now bounding the probability within 0.8 to 1, very small range. And what is the probability that, uh, what is the range of lambda in that particular probability range? So that has a linear relation. So you can see that this is the nonlinearity index axis, this is the improvement, performance improvement axis. So lower nonlinearity, the improvement, improvement uh, in this region is always higher. So you can expect that if you have a one nonlinear nonlinear problem, your performance improvement will not be very good. If you go up towards this axis, you can find that there is higher probability that you have a very good no, uh, performance improvement by UK. So, so now we have a tool. Now we have a tool. If we know the nonlinearity. If we want to calculate the, what is the probability, 80% probability that uh, you get performance or performance range will be in some uh, some within some values. So using the nonlinearity, we can now say that okay. So for lower nonlinearity, the range will be very small. And high nonlinearity, you have a very good improvement you can expect. So the verification of these two formulation. One was I was talking about that that, that um, this equation here. So these values will not never exceed this. So this is the value of the bound, and this is the actual error, Hilbert-Schmidt or relative efficiency error. You can see that this is always below below that bound. This is for re-entry vehicle problem. For launch vehicle problem, this is the bound and this is the error. 
while you will say, okay, this is now going up. There's something wrong here. What's wrong? The problem was that for the, 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 the number of receiver, at certain, after a certain amount of time, the clock resets in the receiver clock. And in that time, it has a bit of spurious measurements. So that's why, so these are really unrelated with the estimation problem. But what is happening here? So there is an assumption of deriving the relation between nonlinearity and performance, the uh, performance. So the assumption is that that performance will only hold when the filters are in steady state. So here, this filter is in transient state because we are starting at zero. And when it goes in steady state, <coughs> it follows the bound. The same thing happens for launch vehicle problem. We can say it's within the bound. And now, we already have that probability bound. So what is the bound of the improvement with probability point A? You can see for launch vehicle, for launch vehicle and DNT vehicle, exactly within bound and the improvement as expected, it should be high. For LEO satellite here, it's here. So lower non energy, very low non energy, and definitely, which tallies that there, there will be no improvement at all, or insignificant improvement. So our experimental results are backing up the whatever theory we have derived. So then uh, we, ha uh, we have a mean. We have a mathematical framework to compute the non linearity index, and based on that, we can say, well, okay, for this system, UKF will not be useful. For this system, UKF will be useful. So this is very a uh, good aid for designers now. So for uh, suppose for a designer, somebody comes and say, okay, for this system, you design an estimation algorithm. They don't have to simulate the whole estimation, whole scenario for UKF for UKF, and say, oh, no. We have to use UK, or we have to use UK. You can, without doing any simulation using simple mathematical computation, you can do that. Now, as we have already said, that with dilution, uh, with number of satellites, the uh, error ratio changes, which is not, um, which doesn't match with the conventional notion of dilution of precision. So. What is the dilution of precision? GPS provides us a range measurements, and if you take the Jacobians of the all the range, range uh, measurement vector, so all the uh, range at a particular time is stacked in particular vector and take Jacobian, and there's a matrix called G, which is the measurement Jacobian transpose multiplied by the measurement Jacobian inverse. So diagonal elements of G matrix gives us the dilution of precision, and so obviously it will be four because for satellite uh, for a GPS based estimation we need three uh, uh, position so x y z three and time four time bars four so g four is for the, for the time and g one one g two two g three three are for positions so if you use this square with PDOP your error should increase increase PDOP increase error, which is a very linear equation. But here you can see that this is not following. Why is that for Kalman filter? What we found is that the relationship with Kalman filter, in Kalman filter frame, framework, the relationship of accuracy and the DOP is not linear. It's a hyperbolic relation. So you can see the sigma is the sigma x, sigma y, sigma z. These are the uh, uncertainty in x, y, z axis estimated by uncertain color or any color filter and D1, D2, D3 are actually G1, 1, G2, 2, G3, 3. So you can see there's a hyperbolic relation because D square is a, or say, you can say it's a quadratic relation, but for sigma square, it's hyperbolic. The same thing for UK. The relation is a bit complex, but you can see that the form of this relation G is a quad, uh, matrix quadratic equation. So obviously it will result in a hyperbolic equation. So what we did with, was that we start again with the experimentation with launch vehicle, LU and satellite, and DNT, not DNT, because in the, during DNT you can't get GPS signal at certain point. So for this scenario we have done, so you can see that 
we have plotted the position error by sigma r square versus PDOP hyperplane. For radio satellite, all are hyperbolic, but the difference is that here there is a separation between all the filters. Here it's almost same. That is the consequence of non linearity. As the, all the filters will work, act as a in a similar fashion, obviously there will be no separation in these curves. So that there we have so we have found the relation between the um, if error and the PDOP for different filters. So it is nonlinear. We have now mean to measure it or express it in a way. So now the conclusion. So again I'll repeat the first slide that what is the contribution. So we have presented you two computationally efficient unsimilated carbon filters. So we have done the um, computation time analysis theoretically to show that what are the limitations of this filter and in terms of processing time. And then we have established, which is very important, we established the nonlinear relationship between nonlinearity and unsimilated carbon filter uh, performance improvement relating to EKF. And then we have characterized the computer uh, the uh, carbon filter efficiency with DOP. So these are the contributions of my PhD research and future work. So what we are going to do next? So now you can see that filter performance depends on two factors. One is for G GNSS application, one is non-linearity, one is DOP. You can use these two properties to switch between different filters in real time and to get a very optimal uh, resource management management. So you can lay out that. So we are, we are we'll, we will be working on this particular type of switch mode carbon filter soon. Then can we include the particle filter in this framework? So answer is yes we can. We can improve the particle filter efficiency using the extrapolated single propagation technique. And we have done a bit of work. I'll show you this interesting work soon. And then the can we use SPUKF and SPUKF for high earth orbit navigation? Because in high earth orbit, definitely, if it's not circular, most of the time it will be highly eccentric, and highly eccentric means I don't know. And we want to see uh, what is the performance of these filters in this navigation problem. And then uh, application of the extrapolated single propagation technique in other areas than estimation algorithm. So this is a, a bit of off topic, but uh, I am pretty much eager to uh, discuss this. So this multi-body dynamics is that suppose your spacecraft is going in a multi-body system. Suppose your spacecraft is going to Jupiter or Saturn and there are multi -mo multiple moons. There, Newton's simple Newton's second uh, Newton's gravitational law of two-body problem will not work. Now there's three-body problem. Entirely different scenario. It's hard to compute the trajectory. What is going on? Uh, where the spacecraft will be? So in the, those missions, you have to do lot of simulations. You have to do take lot of um, lot of initial conditions and propagate them one by one, or at, a, at the same time, propagate them to find out what is the optimal trajectory. So you can use the extrapolated signal propagation technique there to reduce the computation time for optimization process. And also you can use this nonlinearity index to predict what is the final uncertainty of the spacecraft position without using any institution that you can do. That's a hypothesis, but I hope that could work out soon. And then particle filter. So particle filter is different than other common filters. In uh, common filters, EKF, UKF, SPUKF, you, you, in the update stage, you have to use matrix decay equation, you have to use common gain, but in particle filter, you don't need that. In particle filter, what you have is that, Suppose you have a mean 
and you have a uncertainty. You have to create random particles using those statistics. You create a lot of random particles, 200, 300, 400 particles, and propagate all of them. For UK, it was safe. For, if you have three state, uh, state elements, it would be seven sigma points you have to propagate. But here, it, it can be 100, it can be 200, 300, 400, 1,000, even sometimes 5,000 uh, to 10,000 particles are propagated for very greater accuracy. A lot of time. It takes a lot of time. So after the propagation, how do you update using the measurement? So what you do is that from the measurement, you find that what is the probability that the what are the uh, what is the probability that these particles fall in the measurement uncertainty? So obviously this this ellipse is basically gives you the measurement uncertainty expressed in terms of states. So obviously these states have less contribution to, to the actual statistics. So much weights are, has to be given here. So what you do is that you do the weighted average. You put a lot of weights in these regions. You put very less weight in this region to get a good estimate. So that's what particle filter does. But the main struggle it has to do is during the propagation. So what you can do is that you can use extrapolated signal propagation technique because that ESPT technique is not based on UK framework because you, when you have these several points, if when you have the intervals, you, using those intervals you can just propagate only one state vector and then approximate all the others. So in ESP UK, uh, so this if you apply this between particle filter, there also instead of thousand points, you have to put only one of it. Still, you get all the other points in a very desired statistics. The results. So we are comparing particle filter, comparing uncentered column filter, and the new filter, ESP PF, extrapolated single propagation particle filter. You can see that results are pretty much pretty much same. So which basically good thing for particle filter is matching the particle filter accuracy. But here, see that UKF has a very high peak. It, its transience is very high. So, and the other particle filters, for particle filters, transients are low. If you see the average error and average processing time, particle filter is here. So you get average altitude error of less than eight. But processing time is 200 milliseconds. At least 10 times that the uncentered common filter. So UPF is somewhere here, and this ESP, uh, ESPPF is here. So it's almost 10 times reduction in computation time for ESPPF, and accuracy is also significantly improved than the uncertainty common filter. So that is a work in progress, and we hope to submit this result soon in a journal. So that's all. Thank you very much. And yes, acknowledgement, obviously, Professor. And Dempster for believing on me, for, for trusting me in 2014 when I didn't have any of the novelties. <laughs> but he still trusted me as it go ahead. And then obviously Australian Center for Space Engineering Research. Uh, there uh, here uh, Dr. June June Eman and Cheryl have, was uh, very supportive to me, helped a lot. And also the signal processing group. I think only Vin and Donna is here, but still you you are good. You are you have been a very good support system for me. Thank you very much. And obviously, if you have any questions, you can contact.